Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Good to morning. See you. Good morning, Sochi. I met with some of your team yesterday from your college on outcomes. It was fun to meet with them. Oh, did you really? Who did you meet with? Was it Kevin? Howell yes. And maybe Dixie, maybe? Yes, that was exactly who it was. Nice. That's awesome. I'm so glad you guys are all here and you found your way. I received a few emails this morning um, asking for the link. Oh. So I was a little bit <laughs> concerned, but I think they had put it on their calendar, but had not signed up for the actual event. Um, so I think that that may have been the disconnect, but I sent it to them. Um, so hopefully, hopefully they'll they'll find their way. Oh, I had um, an instructor who, I, I don't know if she deleted the link or what happened, but she didn't have the link. And then she tried to, I sent her the read registration, but she wasn't able to do that either. So that's probably what you're, are you talking about that or no? Uh, well, when I sent them the email of to the link, you know, I, I sent them that e email, for, I forwarded it to them and I said, you know, you, you have to register. Here's the link. Um, and I didn't hear back from them. So I assumed that then they registered. Yeah. I actually heard back from one at least that said like, oh, I never saw this email. So yeah, let me register. So Perfect. yeah, it, so hopefully it, I mean, there's people coming in. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm happy. Is mm -hmm. I hope everyone's ready for a break along. Well, I don't know. I don't know how long your Thanksgiving break was, but uh, not long enough no matter how long it was, not long enough, I'm sure. Um, but I hope you are all ready for a, a break soon. All right, I think it's 10 o'clock. So we will go ahead and get started because we do have a full agenda. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is our second norming session of this academic year. Um, so, so happy that you are all able to join us. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's see if I can go. You guys can see my, uh, my, sc my screen, my slides, right? Everyone's okay with that. Okay, perfect. All right, so here's our agenda to, for today. Uh, we have, we're going to focus on section B as our norming topic. We're going to talk a little bit about equity. We have a college spotlight. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Canvas course template that we have in the commons. And then we'll wrap it up. The meeting is from 10 to 12. Um, our upcoming meetings are March 7th and March 29th. So mark your calendars, but do uh, be on the lookout for uh, the email. And by the way, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. My name is Sochil Tirado. I am um, your current uh, poker lead with CBC, and I am so happy and excited to be here with you all. Um, I've met a lot of you already and uh, in, in Zoom meetings, and if I haven't, maybe I'll meet you soon. And um, I mean, we still have a few months before we go to OTC, but I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting a lot of you there as well. Um, all right. Let me see. Of course, I have a potential spam call at this time. <laughs> We're glad that you're all here. The session is being recorded as it was indicated when you joined. Uh, we do um, share the recording of all of these meetings. You can find them right now at our poker site. Um, and I will do my very best to post this recording before the end of the week. Um, so that way, uh, if some of your team couldn't make it, uh, you're able to, um, to share that recording with them. Um, and yeah, let me go ahead and go on. Um, I am so, so very happy to welcome uh, Marilena Fernandez that is here from College of the Sisicues. I hope I said that right, Marielena. Uh, 
<laughs> Good. So Maria Elena is going to be here helping with poker. Um, so she'll be here in this meeting. And so if you guys are going through the poker process, she may be joining some of our meetings. Um, and today she's going to handle our chat. So I'm not paying attention to the chat. Maria Elena is. And um, I know that the chat is in good hands. So welcome, Maria Elena. Um, I'm I'm very excited to to have her, and um, you know, hopefully, we will all be in some future poker meetings together. All right. Before I start with the norming topic, I do want to share the attendance agenda. Uh, I'm sorry, the attendance, uh, the sign in with all of you guys. So give me one second, and I will drop that in the chat. Um, it should be a shareable. Uh, document. I made sure that all my documents were shareable. So um, just go ahead and open up that spreadsheet and go ahead and sign in next to your college's name. If you guys have any issues signing in, please uh, let me or Maria Elena know and we will try to fix it, but it should be working. Um, and then also before I get to norming topic B, I want to make sure that, um, oh, it says view only. Oh, darn it. Okay, I have it open here. So give me one second. Okay, let's see. This one, share. I see you all there. Oh, viewer, um, anyone with the link can edit. Updating, done. Okay, so try it again and I'll drop it in one more time. And now you should be able to add your information in, I'm hoping. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue. Uh, so before I start talking about norming topic uh, section B today, I want to make sure that I let you all know that the way that I'm going to be uh, uh, putting the agenda together for these norming sessions, the first hour I'm going to focus on the norming topics. And then the second hour will be things like sharing from other colleges and like equity like we're having today. So um, I know a lot of you guys are reviewers and some of you are poker leads. So the reviewer content, I'm trying to put it in the first hour. So in case any reviewers have to step out early, they can step out after that first hour. That's how I'm going to be um, handling the agenda moving forward. So hopefully that's helpful information for some of you. Um, all right, then let's talk about uh, section B of the rubric. Okay, so first I'm going to go over um, every single, oh wait, before I do, yeah, actually, yeah, I'll skip that, that's fine. I'm good with time, yeah. Um, yeah, so this, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over most of section B, but we are going to have some time to really focus on section B2 of the rubric. Um, so I'm going to just go over sections B1 through 5 through 6 with you. And at the end, I'll go, I'll go come back to B2. So, okay, B1, pre-course contact. So th these should just be reminders for you guys, refreshers uh, for you. Um, so B1 is pre-course contact. Um, and the purpose of B1 is for the instructor, for the students to feel welcome to the class. So it's a time where the instructor usually contacts the student before the semester begins, typically, and it's usually a welcome letter. Um, it establishes the class environment and introduces the syllabus. There may be the use of a liquid syllabus in there for some. Um, there will be login details, like how do they log into their class? Um, and different protocols. So as reviewers, when we're looking for this item in a course, we want to make sure that we're looking um, in, usually this will come um, in an announcement. Um, if there was a letter, a welcome letter, typically the instructor will, will add it to the announcement and that's where we can find it. Um, if not, um, you know, 
there may be um, an email in the inbox, although you won't have access to that. So you'll have to contact the instructor. But one of the things that I really want to point out here is that we call it pre-course contact, but it is aligned even if the contact occurs at the beginning of the semester. Um, so ideally, it's before the semester begins. However, it is aligned if the contact occurs at the very beginning of the semester. So I want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, but but we do when, no matter when it happens, we do want to make sure that that contact does have the information that the student needs. Like you know, where can they find the syllabus? Where can they you know log into the class? Um, you know, what are the things that the student should know? Um, so that that's the kind of information that we're looking for there. And if there's any questions, you can drop them in the chat. If you have any pressing questions, feel free to raise your hand and I will, you know, you can unmute yourself and we can have more conversation about any one of these items. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on and I'm skipping B2 because I'm gonna come back to that one at the very end. So B3 is student initiated contact. Um, and in that one, what we're trying to do, the purpose of B3 is to encourage students to contact the instructor, okay? So we, um, we want it because, again, the, the course is completely online. There isn't that time where the student comes into classes and is able to talk to us. So we want to make sure that the student is contact, contacting us when needed. Uh, so some of the things, some of the places or things to look for here is um, as reviewers, we want to look for information in the home page, in the syllabus, um, any communication plan that the instructor may have. Um, maybe there's, there's an orientation module that tells the student how they can contact the instructor. Um, this should be easy to find. I think that's a big key right there that it, it should be easy to find. Um, so if it's only in the syllabus, then that you know, may qualify as not easy to find. Um, having it in that um, orientation module with a clear title, you know, that tells like how to contact your instructor. That, that's what we're looking for. Um, and then the information that should be included is the instructor's name, the instructor's email, and the response time. That's what we're looking for as reviewers, that it's easy to find, and that it has this information so that the student can easily contact the instructor. All right, I'm gonna go on to B4. Student initiated contact with other students. So the purpose here is opportunities for students to form a student community within the virtual classroom. Um, oh, I just saw, so I'm, I'm gonna pause because I do see Janet uh, talking in the chat, possibly about uh, B3. Uh, she says, oh, it's going so fast. Um, mostly it's about the document at this point. Oh, okay. So we're good. I can go on. Let, yes. Let me, I, let me just, yeah. Everything since then has been about the document. So we will, um, I okay. will, I'll save the chat if you can't do that. And I'll make sure that we get your names updated. So, and then, oh, wait, uh, Ying Lu said B1 um, has a comment. Oh, yeah, I see it. Uh, we encourage instructors to send out a welcome letter before a course starts and have delayed setting announcements in Canvas, including the same information. Yeah. And I think as a review team, it's important. And I the, the review teams that I've met with for, for any of these, it is really important that you as a review team understand what your criteria is. I mean, we have what the rubric says, you know, and we want to follow that. But then like if your college says like, you know what, it has to be before the semester begins. If that's OK with your union, then so be it. You know, if your college is like, no, you know, it, it should be day one and day one, it should be emailed and it should be posted in announcements. Like as a team, you can create some sort of uh, criteria around any of these items. Um, okay, I see Julie's question. Um, if these rubric elements like student initiated contact, how to contact instructors 
are present but hard to find tucked into a syllabus but not in the orientation module is this unaligned so let me go back to this one um to be three so here i think one of the things that it says is that it it should be easy to find so um so if it's only in the syllabus then can we say that it's easy to find um and again, this is something that your team can talk about. Um, if your team says, you know what? No, it's not easy to find in the syllabus. They should have something in the um, in that module zero or course orientation module. Then your team has a clear indication of like, no, you know what? Yes, it's in the syllabus, but it also needs to be in this other place. Um, so for this particular criteria, I do feel that having it in that orientation module or module zero, whatever you may call it, with a clear title is important because after week one, our students are probably not going back to the syllabus. So in week six, when the student wants to contact you because their grades are not, you know, as they should be or what they thought they should be, we want them to be able to quickly find how to contact you. Um, so that's, that, that's my interpretation for this because it does say easily, you know, it should be easy to find. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, and when I, and if, again, if there's anything, let me know and I'll stop. Um, yes, um, Sachi, can you uh, send me the link again? Um, for, to, the, for the, new, for the document. Yeah, I just. Yeah. Let me see. Give me one second. I think I'll actually... just recopy it. I wasn't sure if the if I had the old one or the new one. This oh, point. does it? Wait, hold on. Let me. I I didn't recopy the new one. Let me see. Is there okay. a? Does a link change once I change the settings? Oh, that's not even it. Sometimes okay. I don't want to share the wrong thing. I have so many documents open. <laughs> I'll I'll send everyone a uh, a totally different document. Okay, give me a second. Let me get that link. Okay, I'm dropping it in the chat. Perfect, thank you. So that is the sign in, and I do see people signing in. So maybe it's just uh, either refreshing or maybe the the link may have changed. I don't think it does though. Um, okay, I'm I'll keep posting on. that link every once in a while. Okay, yeah, please do. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, B4. I think that's where I was, um, which is student initiated contact with other students. Yes, that's where I was. So in this one, what we want to do is we want to create an environment for the students to be able to interact with each other. Um, so one of the one of the keys for this one is that we want this to be unstructured um, interaction. So if you're using like weekly discussions for assignments, this doesn't meet before. Before is unstructured interaction interaction, and that's really hard to do in an online class. Um, so some of the things that we're looking for as reviewers, we're looking for um, the student lounge uh, or a Q&A discussion. Um, you may need to dig deeper to find this, like um, they may have, the instructor may have voluntary uh, partnering opportunities. They may have created some special interest groups in discussions. They may be using Pronto to encourage this kind of interaction if your school has pronto. Um, the important thing here is that this is not directed by the instructor and it is not required. Um, and I'll, I will admit that B4 is a tough one because we want it to be unstructured, unstru we want it to be optional. And many times when I teach an online class, I'll have that student lounge or the Q&A, or both sometimes, and there's nothing happening. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're giving the opportunity for students to have a space to interact with each other. Um, okay. I think we're good. Okay, so I'm going to go on to B5, regular effective contact among students. So here students have the opportunity to interact with other students meaningful in meaningful ways that contribute to learning. So this one, the difference here is that this is structured. 
this has direction. There is intent behind these kinds of interactions. So here we're looking for um, in modules for collaborative group assignments, um, alignment will look different from course to course. We want to look for meaningful discussions, uh, peer activities. This could be paired activities, small groups, whole groups. So what we're looking for here is meaningful interaction. That means that the interaction here is um, it has to do with the content of the course. So as they're interacting, they're learning. Um, so B5 is with intention related to the content before is unstructured, just a place for students to ask each other questions or, you know, like it said, like, uh, like voluntary groups of similar interests where they can talk to each other, things like that. Uh, B4 not required means not graded, and that's correct. So for B4, it's not required. Um, if it's not required, it wouldn't be graded. But for B5, this is intentional. These are typically assignments. This is B5 is typically discussions, like when we have those weekly or biweekly discussions that have to do with the content that we're dealing with. So she, uh, excuse me, so she, what about extra credit on B4? So B4 extra credit. Okay, so let's take a look at B4 for extra credit. So it should be voluntary. So since extra credit is voluntary, it could be, but so the the thing to note in B4, if it's extra credit, um, it has to be a group, like either a, an extra credit discussion, something where they're interacting Extra credit is still volu voluntary, so uh, that would qualify for B4. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a specific requirement for amount? We require one per week. Um, noon, I think it is. I think, are you talking about B5 probably? Yes. Yeah, so there is no set number in B5, and let me double check. Um, but I don't think B5 has a set number. And this is something I'll probably be talking about in the next norming session is how many assignments are enough assignments? Because that's a question that I do get often. Like, you know, when do we say as reviewers, you don't have enough assignments? You know, when do we say as reviewers, you know, you need more content? Uh, because the course author is the expert. They're the instructor of record. We're simply reviewing the course based on these elements, but that is a question that I get asked a lot. Uh, so for B4, um, it doesn't show, um, I don't see any language of a certain number that is required. Um, I think in this one, you just, you know, uh, you. I'm sorry, and B5, it's not B4, you're asking I think for B5. Um, let me get to that. Yeah, I don't, there is no, goodness gracious, I'm going all over the place. No, for the regular, the for B5 um, it, at our college, when we look at B5, we're thinking about, um, does the course design include opportunities? Because this is about um, interacting with uh, ways that contribute to their learning. So depending on how, you know, what it is you're doing in that unit, what are your objectives? Uh, it could be related to the content. It could be related to another element of learning. Um, it could be, um, it could be anything. So I think I think keeping that broad and not limiting it to a certain type of interaction or a certain way that students have to interact. There's there's so many ways, and instructors are so very creative about it that I think it's a good idea to um, to to have these conversations on your campus for sure. To say, well, what look what does it look like? What does it look like in in your area or my area? Or how are we going to decide this as a campus? What we think is appropriate. Um, so. That's when I when I think about how we operate with B5 at our campus, that's what we are really looking for. We try to give a lot of, you know, think about ways that it's going to express it. different instructors will express that. Right. And I think that's the important thing I see. Um, I think it was Jennifer who asked um, 
uh, Jennifer, who asked, what is considered to be regular and effective contact? So I think that's the important thing that within your college, you within your review team, the review team is key here. You know, you do have to have a conversation of what you feel meets that criteria. I think it's hard to put a number on it because there's different ways to show that regular effective contact, just like it says here, like you, there it can be discussions, it could be a group assignment, it can be a peer review. What we want is overall in, and it doesn't like it doesn't have to. I would say it doesn't have to occur every week. Like if you have weekly discussions, great. But if you have like, for example, peer reviews, those probably shouldn't happen every week. I mean, I guess in some classes they may. You know, th those are just a little bit harder to handle as instructors and as students also, because one student has to submit before I can peer review. So, but what we want to see is overall these opportunities for contact among the students overall in the, you know, if the course is 16 weeks, 18 weeks, six weeks, overall, we want to see that there is opportunity for contact. Um, and as Mandy just said on, on the chat, I see it depends on the class because there are certain classes that call for a lot more interaction among students. While there are some classes that, you know, interaction may be hard to come by because of the topic, but still we want even those courses that it's hard to come by, we want to see some opportunities for interaction. Um, so it, it's going to vary from class to class. Okay. So let me go ahead and I'm going to move on to B6 participation. Um, so for this one, we want students to make sure that they understand how they will be evaluated and graded on participation when it's relevant. So when we're grading participation, uh, maybe like in B5, we want to make sure that the student understands how they're going to be graded in their participation. So when we're reviewing a course, we want to look again at the syllabus orientation module, assignment instructions, rubrics, uh, look for a clear explanation of expectations in both quality and quantity. Ideally, this should be easy to find. And I put the word ideally because those words are not really anywhere in the um in the information for B6. Um, but I think for a lot of these, ideally we want the students to be able to find it. So if you have an like a discussion assignment, for example, using a rubric, using a Canvas rubric, it just makes it easy for the student to understand. Or in your instructions, if you tell them like, hey, this is what I want your initial post to look like. This is what I want your replies to look like. This many replies you know, this type of reply. So giving the student that kind of content, um, you know, I feel is important and in a place where it makes sense for them to look um, for B6 participation. Um, okay, I think we're the next one, I'm gonna go back to B2, but before I do, I know that there, I see a lot of stuff in the chat. Um, and I know I'm I'm giving you guys a big chunk, like I'm going over all of section B. Um, and I, I wasn't sure, like, should I just do a few or should I do all of it? So I was like, ah, I'm just going to go with all of it and and have us, you know, cover as much as we can um, in discussing all of this. Um, so um, there is a question I'm kind of scrolling through. Um, uh -huh. Baldwin asked um, for B4, would Q and A need to be only for learners since it is unstructured? And I wasn't sure what that meant. So maybe Sally, if you could clarify, that would be fabulous. Yeah, I was wondering, I always thought Q and A didn't count as B4 because it would have to be informal communication with students to be B4 and not have the, the instructor hovering or or lurking in there. You know, you wouldn't go to the student lounge or the student hangout was my thought. I'm happy if Q&A does count. I don't think it should be the only thing that counts, but I think it should be, it's an opportunity for an unstructured conversation to occur. That's how, how we look at it. I'm right. sorry. 
Right, Maria Elena is right because Q and A is an open discussion, and and typically when we have Q and As, typically we we part of the instructions are like you know answer each other's questions. Like feel free to answer each other's questions. Like don't wait for me to be the one to answer the questions. Um, and I agree with Maria Elena. I I feel like Q and A is. You know, that that is part of B4, but if that's like, let's say that that's the only thing they have um, that th the course has, they just have a Q&A form and there's no other um, opportunity for this kind of unstructured um, interaction to occur, that's where a conversation would have to happen where is that really enough? And I, and I know B4 is difficult because it's really hard we have these, like, we make these lounges, we give these opportunities, and nothing happens sometimes. And then we have a class that they do, like, they are interacting all the time. And you're just like, okay, where do I find the balance? Like, how did I do that? And we don't know how we did it. So it can be frustrating to have these lounges that are never used, or these Q&A lounges that we have to kind of, like, they're unstructured, but we still have to kind of keep an eye on. Um, I do see a hand up. Thank you. Yep. Meg, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, um, whenever I'm facilitating one of the poker courses, I always tell the students, use the wording of the rubric and really dig down into what it, in the intention of the wording. And for, um, uh, let's see, for B4, it says that unstructured student initiated interaction with other students are available and encouraged. So if it's just a Q&A, that would work if it's encouraged, if it's used, you know, so it depends on the um, how, like if you just put a Q&A and then there's crickets going on and you don't tell people to use it and you don't, you know, encourage them, then yeah, it's not going to work. But if it's a really vibrant and robust Q&A, then that could work depending on how the instructor in does that encouragement. <laughs> That, that's a great point. That is a really good point. And then I see Davina saying, I see a QA and a in lounge as a space equivalent to the time in a physical classroom before the instructor arrives or in the hallways as students mm -hmm. um, are, leave the, class, the room. I, I think that's a really good point. And I like what Meg said, like the encouragement. So it's important for the instructor to encourage. And that's why for some of these, especially with before, it, it does say like you may, as a reviewer, you may have to dig deeper because that Q&A may be there with instructions and we're seeing a course with no, we should be seeing a course with no students in it when we're reviewing. So, you know, we don't know, like we're not looking maybe at all of the announcements that occur, you know, we're not looking at all of the interaction that may be occurring. So at times, if there's only a Q&A forum and that's it, it may be simply to have a discussion with the instructor and the instructor may be like, oh no, but you know, um, I, in my announcements, you know, I do this or, you know, I'll do that to encourage. If they're encouraging, then, you know, we can say like, okay, like they really use their Q&A um, to, to have this unstructured kind of uh, interaction. So um, we, we just need to be, we need to be aware of all the possibilities, but I think it's important to have a discussion. And again, the review team really has to come together and understand what it is in your college. What is B4, what does B5 look like? Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and and I see a lot, lots of really good uh, ideas um, on the chat. I read like really briefly, somebody said like, the instructor has either a QA and a or a student lounge and they encourage like, share your pet's picture you know, and then, and then, and then interaction starts. So sometimes we just have to push them. Like, yeah, it's a student lounge. No one's using it, but you know, if we encourage them and push them a little bit, then they'll start using it. Um, okay. I'm going to move on um, because the next part, we're going to look at B2. Uh, B2 is regular effective contact. And for this, we're, we actually are going to um, do a little activity. Um, with, uh, have, I'm going to have you guys all hopefully participate. So I want to go over what B2 is, and then I'll explain to you what we're doing. Um, so B2, 
Um, students have a clear understanding of instructor-initiated contact, how and when it will occur. Um, tips for reviewers. Look for evidence of communication, clear explanation to students of when and how they can expect to hear from the instructor. We're going to look in the syllabus and the communication page orientation module. This should be clearly visible. And then I added regular effective contact can take the form of announcements, messages, discussions, replies, and feedback. So what we're going to do next is I am going to put you guys in groups and there is 145 of us. So there's going to be a lot of groups. Okay. So uh, bear with me and please, I beg you to participate. Um, so what I'm going to do is let me make sure that I have the right one. B2. Okay. I'm going to drop a link in the chat and I need you all to take this link because this link will give will take you to a google doc that's visible to everyone according to my screen right now and this has the instructions of what you're going to do in this activity um, but i'll explain it to you before i put you in breakout groups so you're going to have about 10 maybe a, 10 to 15 less than 15 minutes to talk to your group that you're going to that i'm going to put you in and you're going to discuss, I'm, I'm going to give you a scenario. Do I have a slide for this? Maybe I do. Oh, I do. I'm so prepared. Um, so you're, this is your scenario. You're reviewing a course specifically for regular effective contact. Um, the course includes weekly discussions, Q&A forum. The syllabus includes the following information about communication. This is not included in module zero. So the words in italics is what's included in the syllabus. You can contact me using the Canvas inbox. I will respond within 48 hours of receiving your message. <laughs> I monitor the weekly discussion. I post weekly announcements. And then I'm in your group, I want you to discuss and answer the, these three questions that I posted. Okay? Oh. So the link I just shared with you um, explains all of that. It also gives you the rubric criteria for what's incomplete, what's aligned, and what's exemplary. Um, and then I gave you a link to the course design uh, resources. I'm gonna drop that Google Doc one more time in the chat so that you can get it. Cause once I send you to your breakout group, you're not gonna have access, like I can't send you that anymore. I tried it. Oh no. It says due to heavy collaboration, you may not be able to for large audiences. Okay, so some of you may not be able to get into this document, it says, but I'll try, hopefully hopefully one person in your group got to the document. Um, and I'll try to pop into different uh, breakout groups and make sure you have the instructions. There's also a question, uh, Marari Weber asked if we'll be sharing the recording and I will say, yes, we will be sharing the recording for those who could not make it. We will be sharing the recording, yes, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna create, Oh, how many breakout rooms? I need a lot of them. What's the maximum? What's the maximum amount of breakout rooms I can have? Oh, it does a calculation for me. Oh, it looks like, okay, we'll do 28 breakout rooms, five people per room. Uh, so before I put you guys there, oh, good idea. Okay, so hopefully I'll drop that link in the chat one more time. I don't know if it's going to work for you because it's telling me that there's too much traffic in my Google Doc, but I am sending you to breakout rooms 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'll bring you guys back. All right. Good luck. Open all rooms. Okay. All right.
should set a timer because I'll forget how long they're, they're for. So actually, I created a backup document just uh, if you want, if any of the breakout group people are having issues, I'm just going to drop that in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, good idea. Thank you. That I never uh, imagined that I would get like a timeout. You know? I, th I think it's because we have 100 plus people and there's only so much capacity that Google Docs will have. So just something for future reference. Yeah. It's, you know. it's one of those you learn as it happens. Okay, I'm going to copy that link. Okay, I think I'm going to go join a couple rooms and see if they need the link. Oh, I see. And I did put a timer. Okay. Yeah. I'm probably going to be gone by the time the breakout activity wraps up. That's fine. I have Marilena here, so she's doing right. great with the chat. Thanks thanks for stopping by, Brandon. I know that yeah. you're super busy. I appreciate it. Uh, it, it was just... It was just uh, poorly timed finals all otherwise it stayed through the whole thing that's okay it's fine <laughs> all right i'm gonna go to a room
John, you want to be in room 28? Yeah, because I'm already in there on my phone. I'm just switching over.
Sorry, Bethany. Thanks for saying that. I accidentally exited before I could say thank you. Okay, we're all back. So I hope you remember what room you were in because we were in the best room of all and that was room six. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Before, before we start, uh, I have a poll and there it is. So what did you say it was? Incomplete or aligned? Uh, what if we were split? I, I was going to put in conclusive, but I was like, uh-uh, they have to pick. <laughs> oh, well, you didn't tell us that. <laughs> I know. I was going to, I was like, even last night, I was like, should I add in conclusive? And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to make them pick. <laughs> oh, boy. Now I'm like, I don't even know. Now it's up to me. Great. <laughs> hmm. That didn't seem like 15 minutes. That's what Julie is saying. Was it was it 15 minutes where we it just was? No, no, it we're was. so enjoying our time together. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you guys were enjoying your time together. I'm not sure what to somebody, my group private message me because I don't know what we should do. I'm just gonna take a vote. Well, Maybe. I was voting according to how independent because you sent an independent poll. Yeah. That means oh. I have to vote. Oh. You, you, you vote independently. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's okay, voting. Okay, got it. Everyone's voting. I have 111, 111 people have voted out of 125. Um, and I'm going to end the poll in just a bit. Oh, because you, I can see the result right now, but you guys can't, huh? Right. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Uh, share results. All right, you guys see that, right? So 77% of people said incomplete, while 23% said aligned um, on this. And this is a tricky one. Um, what, did I stop sharing? Am I still sharing that poll? Is it gone? No, I see it still. It's not gone. Okay. Oh, stop sharing. I just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There we go. Stop sharing. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so before we talk, so this was uh, B2 regular effective contact. And a line says course design includes regular instructor initiated contact with students using CMS communication tools and a clear explanation for students of when and how communication will happen. And I am going to call out on a couple of groups because we have we have about seven minutes before we move on to our next part of the agenda. So I'm going to call on the best group, uh, group six. Who was the person with the longest hair in group six? I would like to introduce you to the one and the only, the incomparable, the long haired Katie Palacios. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Camille. <laughs> you, did, you put me on the spot. Um, yeah, we said incomplete as a group. Um, so, Sochi, what did you want me to say about that? <laughs> why? Well, can you, can you, yeah, can you just tell us a little bit about why? Why is it, what would you? Um, because, so we said, we reviewed these areas of your course, and while you are using announcements and on your way to alignment, to be fully aligned, we recommend adding clarity to how and when you would you will be participating in the discussions. We basically found um, that monitoring discussions seemed a little vague and they needed some clarity added there for us to feel comfortable marking this aligned. Okay, that's good. That's great. Um, all right, I'm gonna call on another lucky group. Hopefully you guys remember what group number you were in. I'm gonna go with group 18. Do we know who the eight leader of group 18 is? Anyone wanna volunteer themselves for group 18 leadership? I have no idea what number group I was in. I know. I was thinking of that too. I was like, I don't know, I know what group they're in. Okay. Anybody would, would anybody that was, um, that was uh, made a leader in their group, would anybody like to uh, add? Oh, D Davina, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go. I don't know what number we were. And I definitely won the long hair contest. Doesn't <laughs> look like it because it's all up in a button. Um, but 
Uh, that being said, uh, we were split. Um, and I guess if we had to pick, we would probably end up in the incomplete based on the same wording is monitoring. So contact we felt like was okay. Um, certainly wasn't exemplary, but met requirements, but that monitoring. So the discussion was if we looked at the course and saw that there was more than just a monitoring, maybe there was feedback, summaries being provided, uh, references and announcements, et cetera, um, then our recommendation would be to the faculty member to clarify that language for the student and uh, let them know how that monitoring uh, would look like and what feedback they would get from that. Um, if in fact we found that it was just simply a monitoring, it would be incomplete. Okay. So I'm curious about the uh, aligned folks. What We've heard a lot about the incompletes, but for those folks who felt it was aligned, um, what um, I'm looking at um, Tracy's uh, ideas there, and we, some of our group felt it was aligned and some felt it was incomplete. So I'm curious, what do, what are the aligned folks saying? Sarah had her hands up. And Sarah, yes, Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, I can um, I can report back for our group. We actually unanimously said that this was aligned. Um, if we look at the the wording of the course design rubric and also look at the course design res resources in Canvas, um, it meets alignment. It it meets all the standards. It says to look for evidence of communication, but a clear and a clear explanation to students of when and how they can expect to hear from their instructor, and they met that standard. Um, to move to alignment, we suggested that they um, uh, create a communication plan and not have it not only in the syllabus, but also possibly on the homepage or in an orientation module, um, and also um, provide clarity um, to what monitoring discussion boards mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. Yeah, we, we did, we split up too. So we split, uh, we had different conversations. It was good. I We had a great group. We were group four. All right, I'm looking at all the comments and you guys, you guys all, oh, I have another hand. Yes, uh, Camille. Hi, okay, so I love Sarah, Sarah and what I heard from Davina, of course, from my group uh, with Katie. One of the things that I, what we were saying is, I didn't want to give the person a line, even though I know that it could very well fall in alignment because when we look at it from a letter of the law, did it, was it missing some spirit? Was it missing some connection? Was it missing some relatability? Absolutely. So it's one of those things that as reviewers, um, I've had to learn how to understand that some people will just check a box. And the way they check a box, it could be the most bland, seasonless statement there is. So I cannot hold them be to, they don't have my personality. They don't have my 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 excitement they're not maybe they're not even using chat gpt to sprite to spice it up right um so they're missing it and so it's it's really that hard thing where you're trying to help your peers and you're in these peer reviews you want to esteem your colleagues you want to make sure that they know but you also think about the student because if you're the student you put yourself in the student when i first came to mount san Jacinto college the first thing i was doing was looking at it as a student now I can look from an instructor view, but looking from a student perspective, how disconnected, how like, oh, this this professor is going to be boring. And but you want to make sure that you teach and share with your peers. There's a way that you can spice up a simple statement that can literally cause that student to buy in wholeheartedly within the first few pages of your syllabus that will put them on a trajectory of success. So I knew it was going to be a split hair incomplete or aligned, nowhere near exemplary, but just a, just a little, little dab of spice of personality could have changed that whole statement. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we'll go with Cynthia and then Meg. Yeah, our group spent some time talking about, and I know that, you know, we were just given a scenario and looking in the course would have been completely different. But one thing that really stood out to us was even if we were looking in the course, um, the part that was really hard for us was the, the bold piece, um, clear explanation to students. So if the students couldn't find a clear explanation, that for us was really kind of the hang up to say that we really felt we needed to mark it incomplete because um, we had a hard time finding where that clear explanation 
was. Um, and so if we were able to dig into that, and even if we had to dig, if it was really hard to find, I think that also helped us lean more towards the, the incomplete status as opposed to the line. So just thinking if we have a hard time as reviewers finding things, just imagine how hard it can be for our students to find those things. Mm -hmm. Good point. And Meg. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking about, um, and sorry, I already forgot who said, um, who, who invoked the idea of the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. And, um, but thank you for bringing that up. And, um, and also the idea of coming out from the student perspective. So if, if you are on the fence, it always helps. I think it's always your best um, bet to err on the side of what would benefit the students and a better clear written thing. Yes, would definitely benefit students. But I also want to bring up how we often talk about how we do these norming sessions because the rubric itself is kind of truncated, you know, and we've often said if if we were able to explain every possible scenario, the rubric would be like 500 pages long. So our job is to dig into the spirit of each um, criterion as much as the letter of each criterion. So um, I'm kind of contradicting myself because I said earlier, always look at the wording, but you know, the, there are always subjective qualifiers. And so it says clear communication plan. I don't think that was clear. Monitoring wasn't clear. So the spirit of it, I think would be to call it incomplete. So yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm going to do last one because we do have to move on and I'll wrap it up. Uh, Lauren. The thing I wanted to add was um, our group talked about adding their feedback communication policies that a lot of times, and in general, when I talk to instructors about this, often they're doing a lot more communicating with their students than they actually put anywhere in their course. And so I'm like, hey, show off all the stuff that you're doing. And um, a lot of that has to do with the various ways that they're giving feedback. So that's the one point we haven't covered that I just wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks for adding that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and 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 close off the discussion uh, with I don't have an answer for you guys. And <laughs> after I wrote this, sorry, sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not because it it it's very vague, and I I'm the, I'm the creator of that scenario, and I created it vaguely, you know, to to help us have discussion like this. Um, but I do so so I think it. it it had to be big because I wanted you guys to discuss, but um, I do feel, I, I feel both sides. Like, I feel like we don't have enough information. I want to do more digging. And at the same time, I feel like, well, you know, that there are some parts of the, of that criteria that do meet it. So one of the things I want to, you know, point out to you guys that have been discussed in the chat and, and shared, uh, you know, verbally is, as reviewers, like this rubric, th there's so much in it, but there's so much missing also, um, right? Um, so he here's my recommendations. Uh, when something in the rubric, and I, I learned this from a wise person that's in this uh, that that's in this room, um, when so when when something is seems to not be aligned, or we say it's aligned, but mark it incomplete. For the most part, that always works because if you're aligning it and you're saying like it's aligned, here is uh, a recommendation. Then it's just a recommendation. They don't have to make that change. But if we say it's incomplete and we say to get it aligned, like just add these this word, just add this extra thing, then there, that's going to be done. What you know so. They keep that in mind. And then another thing that I want to point out to you guys is we in this room, we're reviewers. We are in this, some of us are poker leads. We're in this kind of conversation constantly. So if we're teaching, we're constantly updating our courses. We're constantly making changes. The people, the, the courses that we're looking at those courses may never change. They may be copied from semester to semester. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. Like, you know, if, if we leave it alone and it's copied 
five years from now and looks the same. Is that okay? So just keep that in mind because as some of you that have been part of this group for a long time as I have, we are getting instructors that have been copying the courses for years and years and without my college does not have a re-review process, a refresh process yet. And now I'm kind of seeing the effects of that. It's like, oh yeah, like I shared that with you, but I shared it five years ago. And now it's like not so great as the new, the new piece I have, but because there's no refresh process, you know, the instructor thinks, hey, I'm aligned, I'm good. So just keep that in mind. Um, so I'm going to uh, close it out and I'm going to thank all of you for participating. Thank you for, uh, you know, talking with your group when you were in the breakout rooms. I didn't know how this was going to go because this is such a big group. Um, it's hard to handle. So I do appreciate it. I, I do hope that you found the conversation meaningful and I apologize for not giving you an answer, but there's just, no, I, I don't because I want you guys, I want you to talk to your review team. And as reviewers, we just need to, we need to make the decision. Like we need to decide and, and, and that's what we decide. We've gone through the training. We're going through these, we come to these meetings, you know, we talk about it. So what you decide, you know, I'm confident with your decision. I really am. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. I I have my agenda printed and on my screen and on. So oh, before we move on, uh, Richard asked about a refresh process, um, and I wasn't sure what that meant. Um, a refresh process, Richard. Could you Hello, I can elaborate a bit. Thank you, Maria. Not, sorry, sorry. Just to make that's sure. right. So, so she was mentioning the scenario of the instructor with the, you know, those were my recommendations five years ago, but things are different now. Things have changed now. We're better now. So I, it was an implication, but we've been, it's something we've discussed too at East LA College that, well, what happens next? You know, after we've reviewed this one course and we know they're going to evolve, how do we, I don't even know how to finish that sentence. Okay. Yeah. No, and that I think that's a conversation that we need to start having at with our colleges, with our review team, because you're absolutely right. Like I can, we all have this one instructor that teaches one specific course online, the rest face to face uh, on ground, and and that course was aligned five plus years ago. Mm -hmm. But there's no requirement to attend professional development in specifically in DE. There's no requirement for anybody to look at the course again. And this is I'm having this conversation at my college and it's a hard conversation mm -hmm. because then they the 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 people I'm talking to are the DE committee, which are committed to DE. But at the same time, they're like, well, what about the on ground people? Like we already did all of this stuff to get our course reviewed. And we're asking them for more. Um, it, it's a hard conversation, but I think it's something that I think each college needs to start thinking about. And, you know, I, I'm talking to you as a poker lead and, you know, as a DE coordinator from at a college, um, just, you know, something for a seed to plant in your head if you haven't thought of it yet, but I'm sure most of you have. Um, and maybe that's a that's something that we can talk about at our next storming session in the second hour, because the first hour is um, is um, is for reviewers. And but one more comment and then we really are moving on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know what, once you have gone through the poker poker process and getting your class aligned, we all know who we are and we're a bunch of virtual classroom nerds is who we are. And the likelihood of us not keeping up on what is latest and greatest in our classrooms, I find that to be very unlikely. I have now created a spreadsheet to make sure that I make all the new updates to every one of my development shells so that even though I might not be teaching it that semester, I know that that class still needs that update. <laughs> so, I mean, that's something I think we should keep in 
consideration when we're looking at the evolution of material for our classrooms if if we're poker certified because we put in a lot of hours to make that happen and I just can't imagine anybody saying oh well I've done it it's done I'm never going to do anything else ever again I just don't think that's who we are as this particular group but that's just me <laughs> no I, to I totally agree with that totally agree and I, and I love the idea of keeping like track of these are the changes that have to be made because we're making them in the courses we're teaching but as you mentioned, what about the ones we're not teaching? And it's so much that we forget. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we are gonna go ahead and move on to our next topic, which is uh, equity. And um, we have Nora Mitchell, it's Nora and Lori Ellen Riku, Riku, I don't wanna say the name wrong. Hi all, I'm Lori, Lori Ellen Riqua. Thank you, I'm so sorry, Lori. Um, I, I was trying to practice before, but I was like, I don't know if I'm saying it right or not. Uh, and Nora is here as well. Nora is not here. She had a family emergency. So oh. you get me. Um, uh, all right, Lori. So, um, then, uh, just to let you all know, I'll, I'll finish my introduction. Um, Lori Allen is from Laney College and she's going to be talking about I don't I want to I don't want to misinterpret but I think it's it's about equity but it's about using the Peralta rubric right that's correct yes all right so I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to Lori so that she can tell us all about um, how what they do at their college that would be fabulous and I would love to be able to share my screen if possible I think you're able to you should be I hope not yet. It's not letting you? Yeah. Um, so I'll start talking while you're fiddling. Um, like so she said, my name is Lori Ellen Requa, and I am I wear many hats like you probably all do, um, or one hat with a lot of attachments. Um I am poker um coordinator at Laney with Nora as well as DE co-coordinator. And um, I'm also biology faculty. Um, so I have been working on um, equity in my classes for quite a while. Um, and specifically what I'm gonna talk to you all about today is infusing more equity into poker. I actually think that poker does a good job for us, um, but the Peralta Community College District, which is four sister colleges, were a little large, um, built an equity rubric several years ago, and I'll talk about that history in a moment. And so Nora, when she built our poker program, really incorporated that equity rubric into our poker review. So just to go over what our poker program is at Laney, Nora developed a three-phase program um, and the three phases you can see here on the screen, the first one is self-paced where faculty enroll in accessibility training. It's a very fundamental accessibility course. You've probably all seen it. Um, um, we borrowed it from at one. Phase two then is a mentorship program where faculty get paired with an experienced poker um, trainer. So currently at Laney, we have four mentors, four mentees. There are weekly workshops where we meet and we discuss one of the rubrics. Um, our mentors specifically have create, completed the Peralta online equity training in addition to poker training. So our mentors have worked with the equity rubric, have, have, um, have aligned their courses, not just with the poker, um, rubric, but with the online equity rubric as well. Each week of the workshop focuses on a section of the CVC OEI rubric. And then the last week is focusing on section E, which is the Peralta online equity rubric. <laughs> um, we also have a design to align support course that includes a section on E, which is the equity rubric. And the design to align also incorporates all the other sections of the CVC OEI rubric. Um, phase three then is kind of finalizing alignment. This is self-paced with that mentor support. So phase two is kind of the most organized, um, kind of heaviest lift portion of this program where um, 
people are working one-on-one -on -one together and in groups and oh, I, I got a new computer and I don't know what <laughs> all the settings are. So apparently you got celebration balloons. Um, I'm just gonna put my hands down and stop using them. So then phase three is when um, folks really align their course. So this is just an example of what we do at Laney for our poker program. Um, now looking at the Peralta online rubric, um, so this was intentionally written as the fifth section of the CUBC OEI rubric, and specifically to re reduce achievement gaps in online and hybrid classes by understanding the student, by better understanding the student user experience. Um, it was originally prepared for presentation at the CV, I'm sorry, the CCC online teaching conference way back in June of 2018, which feels like a millennia ago. Um, but then it was presented at the Online Learning Consortium um, in November 2018, where it won an award for effective practice. Um, I think I see a, a hand up. Ying, do you have a, Ying Liu, do you have a question? Um, yeah, uh, thanks. Actually, I was I was wondering, um, maybe you will cover it later on, but um, since you were you know, talking about the mentorship program, it looks really intense. And so I don't really know, I don't really have a specific question. I just have a general comment that, yeah, so there's weekly meetings between the mentor and the mentee and it just, it looks really intense. Yeah, it is. And actually it's a good question. Um, we compensate faculty, it's not very much money, but we are able to support our faculty um, with some finances. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to say. We're in education. There's always fighting for money, but we we did fight to get some money, um, both for the mentors and the mentees. So so people are getting a little bit of of money because it is intense. And honestly, um, we have gotten really good feedback that faculty feel supported going through the process um, because aligning a course to the CVCO rubric, rubric can be really scary. So you get a professional who helps you do it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So the original team that developed our equity rubric um, way back in the day um, are listed here. It was really faculty driven um, with Chelsea Cohen, who was faculty, um, Inger Stark, who was faculty. And then also we had heavy student participation. Um, so you can see Corey Hollis and Nessie Moore were two students that, that really drove it. And then um, we hired an independent consultant, Kevin Kelly. You probably are familiar with his name. He's around um, the DE world. But then remarkably, we also had quite a bit of district support um, to do this rubric at the time. So we just wanna do a shout out to our district support that gave us um, what we needed when we needed it. So what is the rubric? Um, these are basically how we've divided it up in the design to align poker support course. Um, and this is the section E. So this is the equity section. And it includes these um, eight um, topics, technology, student resources and support, universal design for learning, diversity and inclusion, images and representation, human bias, content meaning, connection and belonging. Um, and it may seem like there's some overlap with the CVC rubric um, because there is a little bit of overlap for sure. Um, but what is unique about the equity part here, especially as kind of E4 through E8, and this is where students can really then see themselves in the course content. And that's really the point that that um, the developers of this wanted to make was that students have examples of themselves represented it in the content, but also they can infuse their own exp life experience into content. So that's really what that diversity and inclusion E4 through E8 connection and belonging is. So I'd like to give you some examples now of, of how um, our faculty put this into play. And the first one is Scott Godfrey. He's um, political science at Laney. Vote for him states, 
As an instructor who spends a fair amount of time considering what I can do better each semester, the equity rubric gives me an invaluable tool to step outside of myself and interrogate my material through an equity perspective. I also use the rubric as a feedback tool by having my students review classes as part of our material in civil rights. So what does he do? What's an example? I have an example of an assignment here. So this is section E in action. And this is a discussion that he does in his class. Um, he gives us how much it's worth. Um, and it's and it basically says this week's discussion is a chance for you to consider all the material we've covered so far and the way in which I've presented the material to you. So one of the things that that Scott does is he defines equity. Um, he then refers students to the Laney College Equity Committee who developed the rubric and then gives explicit instructions on how to apply that rubric to his class. So down for this discussion part, he says, I want you to consider how I presented our material so far and discuss how I may improve. So this is an, an instructor asking students to reflect on his teaching in relation to the content and then how he can improve. So the first one is consider the language that I use in my videos or written content. Do you think it's equitable? In other words, do you think the language I use may leave people behind in our class? If so, how should I improve my language? He does something similar in terms of the images. So that's number two, consider the images I post in our material. And then number three is recommendations that the students can give Scott to make his class more equitable. So this meets the equity rubric in that he's asking about, oh, I can't use my hands. He's asking about the images. He's asking about the language. And then he's asking the students to give feedback specific to their experience in the class. So that's Scott's example. Um, a second example is from Dr. Leslie Blackley, Blackie, excuse me, she, she's a biology instructor. Um, she says that students report the emphasis throughout the semester of connecting science to their daily lives, helps them learn the material. They feel supported by the multiple modalities. That's one of the things in the equity rubric, as well as the CVC rubric. Um, they feel supported by the multiple modalities of presentation of material, written, video, images, lectures, labs, and a variety of assignments interacting with the material and each other in support of their educational journeys. So sciences, you know, there's always been um, crazy bias in sciences and kind of a limited view of who, who can do science. So as a biologist myself, we are constantly fighting against this. So this is one of the things that Leslie does. Um, she does a meeting your colleagues um, assignment at the beginning of the class. She's got a welcome video to model how she wants students to interact with each other. And then also gives the directions to her students. So this is meeting E3 of the equity rubric, universal design for learning. Um, she talks about how students um, will be graded by using a rubric. She tells them how to find the rubric by using the three dots in the top corner. And then she gives instructions for the guidelines for the, the discussions, which are, are below that. The other thing that Leslie does is include um, images. So this is diversity and inclusion. Um, so this is E5 in our equity rubric, in, um, images and representation. So with these images then also come discussions of bias as related to gender, race, and representation. With these images then, she can pr more provide diverse um, viewpoints um, and then connect students to the world of science so that the students see themselves in science and then could potentially see themselves as scientists. Um, and that's what that third bullet point is. The last example, I'm a little embarrassed Nora was going to do this part, is me. Um, so I'm also teaching biology. I teach anatomy and physiology pretty heavily. Um, and so if anybody's been to the doctor ever in their life, they know at least at one point somebody has not believed them, right, about what they're feeling or they've had to advocate strongly for themselves or somebody else. So this is how the equity rubric has helped me 
to be a better teacher and help students. And these are quotes that I got um, from my students um, a couple of years ago now. Um, so students have said, I likely would have dropped this course if I was not supported through some really tough moments. Lori, make sure the environment is safe and respectful for everyone. This class really feels like a community where we are all helping one another to do well and want each other to, to succeed, which yay makes my heart sing, but the hard part is how do you get to that, right? So I start off the very beginning of the semester with an assignment on how you wanna be treated. Um, and this, this specific example was kind of early coming out of the pandemic where, where folks were hearing in the news how patients were yelling and spitting on nurses, um, but then also paired with the, our learned ex, our shared experience of being treated poorly by the medical profession. So um, this is all about bias. So this, this um, assignment then is talking about going into the medical field, thinking about biases, how they come up, um, how we can battle them. I have a bias statement that I have students read so they can understand where I'm coming from and the biases that I'm aware of in myself. And then how what they're gonna do by stating one bias that they have seen, called out experience or learned about yourself. And then I open it up to the medical field or all sciences. And then specifically because they're going to be dealing with patients, state two ways or things a patient should do or behave while in conversation with a medical provider. And then one way or thing a student, a patient could say in conversation with a medical provider if they feel like the medical provider is being disrespectful. And then there's replies for that um, to follow up on. Okay, that's my example. Um, are there any questions about any of that? I went a little fast because I know we were behind. Um, so I will stop uh, my share. Maybe. Yeah, there are questions in the chat that I can. So first of all, I want to clarify to everyone uh, what Lori presented is what uh, her college has adopted for equity. So CVC has not adopted anything for equity at this point. Our rubric is staying the same right now. Um, I What I'm trying to do with these norming sessions is I want to have someone that's using something to assess equity during their review so that they can share it with us. And then that way, if you want to create some sort of process at your college, you can get ideas from this group. Um, and if CBC ever decides to adopt something, this will help us uh, make that change or adoption. But as of right now, there is no change to our official CBC course design rubric. Um, so I just wanted to make that clarification. Uh, so Lori, in the chat, somebody is wondering if you could share the compensation uh, uh, yeah. that you guys have. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, that's a good question. Um, so e so faculty get paid for each phase that they complete. So um, the alignment phase, honestly, when we had her funds, it was a lot more. But now that we're back into the non her funds world, um, I believe it's two hundred and fifty dollars to just do the um, accessibility. Um, self paced accessibility, or I'm sorry, it's two hundred dollars for the self paced accessibility. And that anybody can do. So anybody in the college can do that self-paced accessibility and get paid two hundred dollars for it. Um, that's outside of poker. Oh my gosh! I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> or maybe maybe my computer's happy for that. Um, the second phase, since that's the heavier lift, that is a thousand dollars. So going to the weekly sessions, meeting with the mentors. Um, assessing, there's a self-assessment that faculty do, and then the mentors do an assessment. It's like a pre-review of the course where the mentors are assessing each section of the rubric each week. So that's a thousand dollars. And then, um, if faculty go through phase three and, um, successfully get badged, then they get another $500. So that's where it stands right now. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. Ollie has her hand up, and I saw your question in the chat, but go ahead, Ollie. 
Hi, this is Oli, College of the Redwoods, uh, local poker coordinator. In regards to, I was clicking on your website as you were talking and looking at this. I think it's so awesome that you've incorporated equity. Can you speak to just a little bit on the increase in the reviewer workload by expanding the rubric and the relationship that y'all developed between the district, the union, the faculty, all of that in terms of the shared responsibility of accessibility? Because on one of the things that I clicked, I noticed that you guys actually have very delineated language that says the uh, that shares the responsibility and that this is what the district is responsible for like textbooks that stuff and this is what faculty are responsible for um how'd you guys organize all that and get it through and the workload and all that okay so um you may have to remind me of your question so the workload question first um how much does it increase reviewers workload so it's it's just a week. I mean, it is a week. It's just equity is slid in at the end of the weekly workshops. Um, so it does add a week of work for the mentees and the mentors. Um, we used to have a whole separate equity training course that faculty could, could go through. I don't remember the specific details. I think it was a six-week course. Faculty did get paid for it. I admit that I went through the course and I can't remember the details, but it was during COVID. Um, so for our specific CVC OV, um, poker review, it's it's an additional week. We do not, um, we don't require alignment up for the equity for the badging because it's not required at the state. So we have faculty do it. We strongly encourage them. We give them all the resources. We make all the recommendations. But but for poker badging, we don't hold them back if they if they don't do it. Um, although faculty tend to like it more and tend to do that anyway. Um, how do we delineate that? Ha that was a a really easy thing to do when the equity committee first started out the. Um, um, the union was all on board. Um, our district got slammed with several lawsuits by students um, about discrimin discriminatory pa um, practices by our faculty and by our staff. So sadly, it took a lawsuit to get everybody aligned. Um, since then, it's been a harder uphill battle. Um, the district, there was also a question in the chat about funding. The district is not funding the equity training anymore. Um, and the, the union is basically saying that this training can be funded through PD and we can require it through PD, professional development, but that we can't require any more than that. Um, was that all your questions? Did I get them all? I'm scrolling through also. I'm going to ask Sarah to unmute herself because she has her hand up and then we're going to move on to our next part of the agenda. Sorry, you guys. Thank you, Lori. This is so awesome. Um, my question, so I'm also a biology uh, faculty and um, I'm curious, how do you fit for the the example that you gave about being heard at the at the doctor's office, for example, how do you fit that into the learning objectives or the learning outcomes of the course? Um, it's actually, well, for our learning objectives, it's really easy um, because we have a, we have two that it, it works with. We have, um, we actually have a communication out, outcome and we have a using terminology outcome. So I have done this assignment where I have students um, kind of talk in their language and then to translate it to the language of science. Because one of the things I found, if students go in knowing some of the words, medical practitioners take them a little bit more seriously. So I want, we, we have to be multilingual, right? I want them to be able to tell their cousin what is wrong with their cousin. And then I want them to be able to talk to their nurse and be like, you know, now I can't think of anything because there's a hundred people staring at me, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, if, if, if I have, if I have, um, ischemia of, of the cardiac tissue, like 
what's the origins of that? Where does that come from? Because unfortunately, there's a switch that people make in their brains when they hear somebody using specif like, um, specific and technological language where they, they have more respect. And this is the bias thing that I'm trying to teach my students. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I give them points for both. Can I, I, am I muted? No, you're not muted. Oh, okay. um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the class, the class standards, CLAS in, in medical for hospitals. So that's actually included. Um, it's a, it's culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And that is built into the national standards for hospitals and medical care. So you might want to look at that. They yes. have trainings involved as well. Um, also, you, what, what was that again? COA. Could you put that in the chat? Maybe then we could. I'm I'm on the phone. I'm sorry. That's why oh, I couldn't okay. raise my hand. <laughs> Go for it. Um, it's C it's C L A S and it's Think Health, um, but it's um, culturally and linguistically appropriate services. That's the class. It's the national standards. Got it. Thank you. Um, and for like emergency medical and pre-hospital care, um, EMSA is for California. So like if you have any people that are doing EMT or, you know, any of the kind of tertiary <laughs> medical care, um, there's also EMSA has a standard that you, you have to have um, if 5% of your population has speaks a different language or is of a different culture, you have to have, you have to have all, all things, you have to have an interpreter, all those kinds of things. So interpreters are required of hospitals, by the way. Um, and ASCCC has, has a great equity rubric that um, for any courses that they approve. So do you want to look at the equity rubric? We use that at Cabrillo's in our DEI program, in our, in our poker program. Oh, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and thank Lori Allen for her great presentation and for sharing those great ideas. I think we all appreciate those real assignments that you shared with us. Um, and, you know, how we can incorporate that into our classes and, you know, maybe someday into our reviews. Uh, we'll see. Thank you so much. And, Lorian, I got the link that you shared of, of the uh, PowerPoint. Is it okay if I put that up in the po on the poker site with this recording? Okay, great. All right. So we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, is uh, Jennifer here? Yep, I'm here. Yay. All right. So now our college spotlight is next. Uh, we have Jennifer Pakula from Saddleback, um, and she's going to be talking about the, their poker process at Saddleback. So I'll go ahead, uh, Jennifer, and share my screen, and we will, um, I'll let you get started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Soji. I'm putting my... Oh, no, Jennifer, we lost you. You're muted. <laughs> or something. Oh, there you know, I hit too many buttons at once. So okay. <laughs> uh, I just put my email in the chat. The chat's way too wild for me to try to talk and follow. So I'm just not going to look at it. And if you have questions that I don't cover, feel free to email me um, at any time and I can cover them. So I am going to talk about our process at poker. I divided this into uh, poker uh, through the lens of a participant and then the back end of it. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, a little bit of background on our poker process. So we became poker certified in 2019. And then as I just checked the data that we have 131 badged courses. So we've been doing this for a while. And I think part of the reason why we have so many courses badged is that I was able to kind of lead the poker team coming from a lot of experience with poker. So 
I had my own course reviewed in 2016. I went and looked. I can't believe it was 2016 when I first started this. And then I was a reviewer for CVC before there was local poker. So for years, I was reviewing the independent courses that were coming in. So prior to us even starting poker at Saddleback, I personally had been reviewing courses for years. So I already had my head wrapped around the rubric, not only as a participant, but also as a reviewer. Our poker team as a collective whole is me. I'm the mentor coordinator. We have three lead reviewers. We have about 15 peer reviewers. They do fluctuate. I have a few peer reviewers who review a lot. I have a, another group of peer reviewers that have very limited availability. So they might only review one course a semester. We have an accessibility specialist whose job title is accessibility specialist in compliance. Um, so her single job is focusing on accessibility. So we're able to direct a lot of the section D work through her. And then we have an administrative assistant who works on the back end for all of the stipends. Um, I will say that we only review courses that we know can be aligned. So if I have a faculty member come to me and say, I use McGraw-Hill Connect, I say, it's lovely to meet you. You can't participate. Um, so I don't deal with homework management systems. I don't have the woman power, the manpower, the human power to tackle those. So we're just not going there. And I know that some other colleges do review courses that use homework management systems, but we don't. I also, I like to give faculty a heads up that if I look at their course and I know that it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to be reviewed, I tell them immediately, you might not want to do this. So we really only review courses that have the potential to be aligned, okay? So we're kind of weeding out and letting faculty know from the very beginning. I do a professional development about the general process of poker and the rubric twice a year. We have professional development week, we call it flex week in the beginning of January and in August. So that um, happens twice a year through that general, it's very general, there's no compensation for the Flex Week um, professional development, full-time faculty earn their PD hours, but other than that, there is no additional compensation. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the view from the participant side. So when faculty are interested in participating in poker, they can earn a $2,300 stipend for aligning their course, and they have this whole list of deliverables. And what we end up doing is during those PD weeks in January and in August, we I do a blast email to all faculty and I say, I'm looking for poker participants. If you're interested, check out the rubric, review the rubric, make sure it aligns with your teaching philosophy. I'm not here to argue the rubric with you. So if you don't believe in the rubric, don't participate in poker. Um, and so I've had faculty who have reviewed the rubric and said, not my cup of tea. And I've said, great, see you at a different meeting. So I really want to make sure that we're aligned from the beginning. Having done this now for four plus years, I, at the beginning, I worked with faculty who didn't believe in the rubric and it's too much of an uphill battle to convince people to do things that they don't want to do. So, um, Number one, I have them review the rubric, make sure it aligns with their philosophy. Next, I have a Zoom meeting with them where it's about 15, 20 minutes. It's pretty quick. I just want to get my eyes on their current course to see what it looks like because I want to tell them, you have 150 videos without captions. This might be really hard for you to do. Or oh my gosh, your class looks amazing. You just have a few revisions to do. So I get my eyes on the course. I give them suggestions on what needs to be done before their course can even go into the re go to the review team. So I get my eyes on the course. I write them up a to-do list. I let them know kind of the major accessibility items, 
We run an accessibility report. We have the allied Blackboard accessibility report. So that gives them a good idea of where they're at on accessibility. The next step is my faculty center. The faculty center at the college will create a poker shell that is only me and the participant. So that way we can make changes to a not live course. And then that way we don't have to have additional Zoom meetings that I give them a, the to-do list of this needs to be done. I say work on one single week of that and see how many hours it takes you. If it takes you two hours, then this might not be a huge project. But if it takes you 40 hours to clean up one week of this course, this might not be something that you want to do. So um, they work on one week, they email me back, I can log back into their poker shell, give them more feedback. And then after about two weeks of building out their course, I just cut them loose and say, build out the rest of your course, make all of your revisions, and then I'll give it a check before it goes to the review team. While they're working in their poker shell, they fill out the course review prep form. I really talk about the prep form being a map of their course. So the more specific information they include in the prep form makes it easier for the review team to find different things and to look. And then they will receive their 19 page document once the review team has gone through their work. They make all the revisions for alignment in that same poker shell. We meet again to ensure, uh, to confirm alignment. So I typically have them email me a list of everything they've done for alignment. And then I go in and check. Once A through C is fully done, the participant gets moved over to the accessibility specialist to finalize section D. Now section D, we usually are working on from the very beginning, from the very first meeting I have with them on Zoom, I run through all of the accessibility requirements. So it's not a surprise at the end. So I'm telling them everything that they're doing has to be accessible from the very beginning because I don't want them to have to duplicate efforts later on when they get to accessibility. So most times by the time the faculty member gets to the very last item, they likely have a 98% accessibility report. They only have maybe one or two little things to work on. It's not a whole lot that is left over at the very end to work on accessibility because we've started it from the very, very beginning and made sure that everyone's aware of those requirements. Okay, let's do the next slide, please. Okay, so behind the scenes. So what, what else is happening here? So um, I host those workshops. So those are the January and August workshops. Um, I have, I feel like every time I open my email, there's something about poker in my inbox. So I'm doing a lot of communication with um, interested participants. I have, I'd say probably 50% of the meetings I have with faculty lead to a faculty member actually becoming a participant because I get in the course, I look at it, and then I tell them the truth of how close or far their course is from being aligned. And then once they know that, they choose whether or not to continue participating in poker. Right, so those are likely Zoom. Most of the time they're Zoom meetings that we have um, on those. And I do probably 30 of those a semester um, for those Zoom meetings. The poker shell is created by our faculty um, support, our faculty center. So those are instructional designers. I don't have access to Canvas to do those things. So I have to have those shells created, but it is nice because only the participant and myself have access to that. So we're not making changes in live courses. Um, we're not, I'm, I'm able to log in and check their work, however it works with my schedule. Okay. I'm providing that participant with a to-do list of revisions. Sometimes the to-do list is short and other times it's incredibly long, but we try to get the course to near alignment before the review even begins. With the course review prep form, 
it has to have every yes box checked before I'll send it to a review team. Okay? So if they have a no, then I tell them to go back and to check the resource design center for examples or inspiration, or if they're stuck, I'll give them some more examples. But I want everything perfect because I want to give them back a document of 19 pages telling them how fabulous they are, not all these things are bad. So I'd rather just kind of have those like, huh, work on this as a oral communication or through email. But when they get that document back, that official document, I want everything aligned or exemplary. because so I think there's so much more satisfaction of getting this like official document back that says everything you're doing is wonderful. Um, higher than a massive list of things that need to be revised. All right, so I make sure I check that prep form before sending it off to the review team. Next slide, Sochi. Thank you. So I organize the review team. I make sure there is no reviewers from the participants department. So thankfully we have enough reviewers from other, from various parts of the college. So if we're reviewing a sociology course, I'll have a math faculty and a music faculty on the review team, okay? So I'm trying to get reviewers that are more of the eyes of the student. I don't want anybody with prior knowledge. I want this, uh, the reviewers going in without, um, without any prior information or knowledge of the course or the design of the course. The peer reviewers have a week to complete their review. We do two peer reviewers and each peer reviewer receives a $400 stipend. Um, we have one lead reviewer who takes the two peer reviews and combine, like finalizes the review. Now, the lead reviewer also gets $400 because as I'm sure we all know from today's um, group work that we did, people view things differently. But someone's going to mark something aligned, someone's going to mark it uh, incomplete or exemplary, and there needs to be this third set of eyes to make any type of decisions when we have disagreement between the, peer, between the two peer reviewers. Thankfully, our review team has reviewed so many courses now that we're really starting to um, align things really well. Um, but we still have discrepancies between reviewers. So that lead reviewer comes in. The peer reviewers don't have to write complete sentences. They can just do bullet points. They can write, um, you know, different. It doesn't need to be perfectly clean because the lead reviewer's job is to clean it up, finalize it, and make it all wrapped up. The mentor, myself, will review the final document. I want to make sure that I have another set of eyes on it to make sure it's all good. And then I share that document with the participant. I share the, I check in with the participant on the alignment and check the poker shell. So this is a big one. I give them the document and if there's three or two sections that need to be aligned, they work on it, they send me an email. I go back into the shell and then I go through and confirm that they actually did what they stated that they did. Everything will be aligned A through C. And then I move the faculty over to the accessibility, accessibility specialist who will work with section D. Now, because we have a, um, a single person in charge of accessibility, they're able to work one-on-one -on -one with the participant through Zoom, which is fabulous um, to make sure that everything is all set up. And then once section D is aligned, off that course goes to the smart sheet and it gets updated. So that was a pretty lengthy <laughs> behind the scenes of what we do here. I saw a bunch of questions. Let me see. Um, I'll start at the bottom. So I am the mentor. I get release time. I think it's only one and a half LAG. I think it's 60 hours. It's I'm grossly underpaid <laughs> for this work but I love it. So here I am. Um, let's see here. I think um, Ingrid had a question about, can, Ingrid, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. This was really insightful. Thanks for all the detail. I have a project management question. Um, how uh, do you and your team track 
the poker milestones and compensation. So as an example, as a lead, a poker lead, I'm using spreadsheets and a project management software called Trello. Um, and it's a work in progress. And, and I submit requests for compensation with our vice president of instruction office. And, you know, we're learning as we go. So I'm, I'm just curious because we find it to be very time consuming to track the poker milestones because people work at different speeds and you can't just do a lump thing like, oh, here's all 10 poker projects. They're all on the same page and you can compensate at these three levels. It's not like that. It's all over the map. So we, I have an insane spreadsheet that I did not create that our administrative assistant <laughs> created. Um, and she is so fabulous and so organized and I could not do it without her. Her name is Laura Harris. I have to say it out loud. Oh my gosh, she's so amazing and organized. Um, and she really helps keep me on track. I'm also really good on spending money and I never check the budget and every once in a while I should be like, stop paying people. Um, so I, um, I take no credit for the organization back end of this, but you're, I mean, I have faculty who I've been working with for an entire year, right. Prepping their course for review. So the participant doesn't get paid until alignment. And so, you know, that's, you know, whenever that, whatever <clears throat> semester that happens in, but there's, I think right now on my file, I probably have 20 faculty that are in all various stages and it's just constantly, it's all, poker's never stops. There's never any break with it. It's just, and I just have to keep that spreadsheet updated because in my mind, if I think, oh, I'll remember this, no, I will forget it in five minutes. So I am constantly updating that spreadsheet just so I know where everyone's at. Thank Jennifer, you so much. Thank you. Yeah, but, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, by any chance, um, could you share like a, the spreadsheet? Um, like, of course, not the content, but like the criteria in the spreadsheet. Yes, yeah, send me an email. I have a blank file of it because I shared it with uh, our sister college a while ago. And so I have the structure of it without any content in it. Thanks so much. Jen Jennifer, could you put your email in the chat for everybody? Yeah, I was in there earlier. I'll okay. grab it up in just a second again. Yep. Uh, oh, before thanks. I take another question uh, for Jennifer, because I know there's more, I we're, we have three minutes left and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I am going to drop the survey um, that I need you all to complete um, to give me feedback on this session. Man, it better work, you guys. I tested it with Mary Elena. I tested it with my husband. He was able to access it. So I just dropped the link to the survey for this session. If you can, please, please, please take a few moments to fill it out. Um, and I'm going to get, if somebody has one more question for Jennifer, uh, we'll get one more question. If you want to unmute yourselves, it'll be easier than this looking through the chat. Any takers? I'd love to ask, I put it in the chat, but um, if you, you said at the beginning that you do meet with some folks and you just say, oh, I don't think you're a good candidate. And at one point you said, sometimes that's because they have like a publisher course. Sometimes it's philosophical. Sometimes it's an accessibility issue like captioning. Are there other reasons why you might look, uh, talk to someone and be like, oh, I don't think this is going to work for you? Because I love, I love the decisiveness that you have. Um, Your experience yeah. shows. <laughs> awesome. um, so I had a faculty member who had um, a dance, it was a dance class who the videos had no had no audio, but they were movements. And Valerie's here. She <laughs> was working on this one too. And it ended up being, so it was like a different type of closed captioning issue that was a accessibility problem with that one. Um, some of it is organizational structure that I have had seen some types of faculty have had their classes organized in such a uniquely, I'll just leave it at a unique yes. way where okay. I was like, this makes no sense to me. 
it makes sense to you. I'm not sure about your students, but you need to use the rubric organization. And that was just a no-go. So that kind of goes back to philosophy as well. Um, most okay. of accessibility, the other the biggest, the other big <clears throat> accessibility issue that people drop out for is if they have PowerPoint presentations in every module and they say, oh, well, I post my slides so students can download them. I'm like, great, no one looks at that. And they're completely inaccessible and it will take you a hundred hours to make them right. So unless you're willing to get rid of these, you're probably not gonna wanna participate in poker. So that's another heads up that I give them from the beginning. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Jennifer, thank you so very much. That was so, so helpful to many of us here. Um, our next norming session is March the 7th, 2024. I won't share the slide with you because I have 2023 on that slide, I just realized. Um, but I wanna thank every one of you for being here. I do hope you found this helpful. Please, please, um, I'll drop in the chat one more time that survey link. Please submit the survey. I really want your feedback. I want these sessions to be meaningful. I want them to be helpful. And if there's any way that I can improve them, I really want to know. Um, I wish you all happy holidays. I wish you all rest. I hope you all take some time off and I will try my very best to do the same. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Um, I appreciate all of you. Um, and one last push for that survey link. There it goes. Uh, thank you all. Have, um, have a great rest of your week. Great holidays. Get some rest. Bye.